gone off on have been incredibly well received. And the reason is because um, I've got with me today Julie Nags. Hi, Julie. Hi. And Julie is an independent saddle consultant, and she's also a bit of a biomechanics geek, um, uh, which is just a geek generally, actually. She's she's yeah, very, very good at anything technical, and she's there. And so she really, really has this unbelievable understanding of bodies, and that's people bodies and horse bodies and the way that they interact together. So Julie and I have known each other for about eight years now. I managed to find her yeah. when I was having some real problems with saddling my horse, and I really needed someone who wasn't just going to sell me a saddle. And I came across Julie, and that was eight years ago. My, as everything does, her business has really evolved since then, hasn't it? So welcome, yes, Julie. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about your background and what what brings you here to talk today? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I call myself an independent saddle consultant because I'm a little bit different from a normal saddle fitter because I'm, I'm a holistic saddle consultant. So I'm looking at the whole picture, not just the horse or just the rider or just the saddle, but I look at the whole picture because one can affect the other big time. So I'm not out there to sell saddles. I'm out there to help resolve problems and get people get the best performance possible so I, I work with people and my plan is always to make a plan not to sell you a saddle and then as your horse develops the muscle or you develop your balance then you might change what you actually need and at that point we then decide to look at a saddle for you or pick a saddle for you which is very different from the majority of saddle fitters who are out there going hi have a saddle I'm not like that so for me the saddle is the jam in the sandwich you've got the horse and the rider at the top and the bottom and the jam in the sandwich is what sticks it all together and makes it work it also makes it not work a lot of the time and it's amazing how many little tiny tweaks you can make that actually make a huge difference with your performance um, I am a complete geek um, I'm working with um I work with a lot of different people I do a lot of research I'm working with a college at the moment doing some research I'm working with people who are developing a new type of saddle as well. Um, I fit mainly LM saddles and solution saddles, both of which I like. One's tree free, which um, allows the horse to move in a different way. The other one is fitted wider, which allows the horse to move. Um, I started off um, many years ago. I went back to riding when I was in my 20s, um, worked in horse rescue, then accidentally ended up as a job with a Grand Prix dressage rider doing Grand Prix horses and I assumed after that that all horses went to go like that and it got a bit of a shock when I moved to an agricultural college with my horse and discovered that my horse that had been ridden by dressage riders and show jumpers and was nicely schooled was a bit of an oddity <laughs> so from, from then we just I just moved on and um, eventually I met a lady called Lavinia Mitchell who's been my mentor for many years and who's fabulous and she said would you like to do would you like to be on saddle fitter? And she had later said that she took me on because she knew that I would challenge her and it was really, really good to be challenged sometimes. And we've been firm friends ever since. Um, so there's, I work with a lot of different saddle fitters. Um, I've worked with a lot of different companies as well. And I've had the training from a lot of different companies, but I don't want to tie myself to doing one particular type of saddle fitting because I prefer to be able to do bits and pieces of different types of saddle fitting and do what is actually needed for each person actually on the day. So my aim is always to get the horse moving better and the riding moving better and sort out the jam in the sandwich. I love that. So it's all about our jam, everybody. It's about getting the jam right in the sandwich. Yeah, if your jam's awesome. not right and the wrong consistency, you're buggered. <laughs> oh no it's fine don't worry oh you should have yeah just by the way it's perfectly okay um but we just have to put a little warning if there's going to be any um one of the ladies oh, funnily enough one of the oh, one of the non-horsey people I had on was effing and jeffing all over the place and yeah us horsey people would be really good <laughs> so it's fine it's all right we'll just put a warning out there um okay yeah. so that's just an incredible like varied journey and a real kind of different ethos um around saddling but we're not just going to talk about saddling so we're going to talk about the interaction yeah. between two bodies so what's yeah. been your experience um particularly the bit I'm obviously I'm really interested in is your experience of the the two bodies interconnecting or not interconnecting, but you know working together and um the that what that has on a rider's mindset or their confidence or their performance because it's such a key element that you and I properly geek out about this don't we we love yes, it we, but we tell me <laughs> <laughs> tell me your tell me your thoughts on it I just think it's fascinating 
I always think that there's two types, well, there's actually three types of riders. There's your, your doing rider who will do it. They will get the horse to do it, make the horse do it, ask the horse to do it, but they will do it. Then you've got your thinking type of rider who will think about how to get the horse to do it, think about how they're going to do it. And then you've got your normal everyday rider who just gets on and doesn't really do it or think about it or push it or think about it. And I think that's that sort of something. Certainly when I work with someone with horses, I have to work out which ones, which work, which, you know, which per, what which sort of person each person is when you speak to them, because they all have completely different mindsets. And to actually be able to work with a person, you have to be able to put yourself in their shoes a little bit and understand where they're coming from. So some riders, you'll go, you have to talk them around other riders they almost have to talk you around and you have to discuss it it's really really important to be able to work with any type of person any type of rider and really look at what the person actually can actually wants out of the consultation um i've sort of done obviously with jenny i've done little bits of nlp it's very useful to be able to stop and listen and I found that I'm doing that more and more and actually stopping and listening to what the person actually wants out of the consultation. And sometimes it's just a little bit of reassurance that they're doing the right thing. And sometimes you actually have to say to people, no, you're actually doing the wrong thing. And it's really, really important for people to feel confident in you that you're actually going to be able to do something for them and help them move on in their journey. Because a lot of people, they, they haven't got the confidence in their fitters and they haven't got the confidence in the people. So I always look at myself as a completely holistic person. I'll quite often, I'll, I will shock people. I'll go out and they'll go, a problem with my horse's saddle. And I'll say, right, your shoulder, the horse's shoulder's wrong. How's the feet? And they're like, oh, what? Oh, I've got a foot problem, had a foot problem for a long time. And you really have to get people on board and thinking about what, what they're doing what they're thinking about and what they're going to be doing with their horses and sometimes it's almost you need to give them a prescription for change which is something that we're starting to introduce a little bit I work a lot with physios and we're I'm hoping to encourage that we're going to be able to use the prescription for change that maybe you would refer someone to I would maybe refer someone to you because I would feel that they could ha- you could help them with a particular thing and you could refer someone to me and hopefully we can just have a note to give a note to someone that they can then pass on to the next person so that we're actually giving it information backwards and forwards because we and have we, to look at the, the true holistic thing. Yeah, and we certainly work that way, don't we? I mean, a lot of the time if someone, I mean, obviously I work internationally, so I, can't, I can only suggest to you if they're in your area, but if someone is in your area, and I, I say, look, do you know what, like from what you've been saying, I really I really suggest you get this some this thing checked out um, and I will I will refer them to you. And then equally, I know you've referred a lot of people to me because you're like, look, yeah. you know, we've got you now, your saddle's fit and it's all good and everything. But there's something in your head that's really now holding you back. Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about how. Um, how, well, we know how the brain works so we? we know that your body is always trying to be balanced and if you don't feel balanced or something doesn't feel right it doesn't matter um, what's kind of going on yeah. for you your brain is trying to compensate for that all the time and it can't then process the other things you want it to be doing so tell us a little bit about how how the saddle can really affect that well it, quite often people people have obviously got muscle memory and how you work and how you move is all about muscle memory and actually changing that muscle memory is really important. I always say to people that when they're actually trying a saddle that you're, you're always sitting in the saddle that you used to sit in. It's a bit like your brain space. You're always using the brain space that, that you were using before. You've actually got to learn to change things. And I've got little techniques that I can use to actually get people to sit in the saddle after I've changed it. But one of the things that I really like to look at is how people move, how people walk, how people just stand and talk to me because you'll find that when people are standing and talking to you and looking at you they will be standing in a certain way and you can 99% guarantee that if that person has not had a certain type of training they will then get on and ride their horse that way which led to um working I've done a lot of theory a lot of work on theory over the years I've worked with a lot of different people I've gone to a different lot of lectures my CPD days are ridiculous the number of CPD hours I do each year Um, and also I work with a lot of other people who also do CPD and when we get together it's mind-blowing what we come up with so um, 
all of that, you get all of the benefit of all of that intellectual stimulation that we have all year when you do saddle fit, when you do have a saddle consultation, which not everybody wants. So I do tame it back. But if you do like a bit of geek talk, then we can do geek talk. But um, it's all about how your body actually works and whether you're carrying an injury, whether you're carrying a habit, whether you sit at the computer in a certain way, whether you think you've got an injury that you've actually recovered from. And we've talked about this a lot because I've actually I've actually gone through this and um, you will quite often you'll be riding the horse as if you've got a problem when you actually may not have a problem. So when you are standing or walking towards me, I'm always looking at you to see what, how the horse is going to move. And quite often it's a 50-50, whether it's the horse or whether it's the rider. What often happens is that people will say, "Your my saddle goes off to the right. And then as, the, as they're walking towards me, they've got a very, very major twist of the hip towards the right. They'll stand with their arms folded and one hip released. And you're like, actually, is this the horse or is it the rider? Um, and I will quite often be able to evaluate which, which one it is. And then I, most, a lot of people will then fix the saddle to hold the person in place. And I would rather fix the person to hold the saddle in place and fix the horse to hold the saddle in place. And so um, to digress a touch, um, 10 years ago, there was no such things as shims. There was balance use shims, LM use shims. No one else used shims. And we were looked at as like, oh, my God, why are you using a shim? Well, these days, every single range of numbers has got some sort of shimmed numbness in it to help increase, you know, to help adjust the saddle. Now, a lot of people will use this to falsely change the shape of the saddle long term, which means that the rider never learns to change their hip. The horse never learns to go straight. And that's fine with some riders and a lot of riders won't even think about it. They'll assume that that's absolutely fine. But I always say to people, do it for a week, take it out for two days. The whole aim is to get the horse and the rider straight and working together. And this can make a huge amount of difference. So when your saddler comes and says, here's the shim and have it for the next year, the answer is no, we don't have it for the next year. It's a tool and to help you but it's not a crutch to keep you that's going to stay there long term can I just ask um, you about this Julie because this is a fascinating topic that I absolutely love because you know I have been on some yards where um, people have perhaps come out of college or they never really done any CPD or learning about this stuff and they've learned kind of the you know the old the older ways of you fit a saddle to the horse you shouldn't need stuff to adjust it if a saddle fits and there's very much there's still very much this belief out there isn't there that if a saddle fits you shouldn't need pads or risers or this that and the other now we're not talking about pads and risers like the traditional old like you've just said here we need to lift it up or put it down type type of thing we're talking about what tell us what a shim is and and why specifically you use shims because people don't people I know you get this and I get this but so many people don't understand this and I've even been told by someone fresh out of college that um if I'm having to use this kind of thing on my horse's back then my saddle doesn't fit and I you know I had to bite my tongue because obviously you know Yeah. yeah um well, and I was thinking, shall I educate you? And then I thought, oh, no, <laughs> not today. I will do if I need to. I'm learning sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Basically, um, the shins I use are about a quarter of an inch or half a centimetre thick. And one of these, um, I use them in different materials. Um, I think we decided to almost call shimologists these days. Um, and having having worked with um, a osteopath that we know that... Um, has done a lot of materials research i've got really really involved in materials research so i will use different shims and different materials and different layers some of the shims i use will be to restrict the bounce of the rider when the rider is maybe you know a little bit too bouncy a little bit too soft one side is to give different feel um, i use different types of saddle pads under this i you might use a slightly more solid um, shim to support the horse a little bit more I might use a combination of two layers to actually, you know, to, to 
which will give a completely different feel and quite often I'll be there and I'll go right just try this one just try this one and there will be something that will actually change how the rider sits and how the rider moves and that will be for that particular moment in time um one way that I quite will quite often will use shims is because if you've got someone that is maybe um engaging their horse more behind in canter the horse will need to sit back by changing the shims for a couple of weeks you can actually change the balance of the saddle to put the rider in the correct position to allow the horse to do a clean change that makes a huge amount of difference when you've got horses that are show jumping that are landing on a particular leg or leaving a leg behind quite often we can adjust the shim slightly to actually change the balance of the rider and the saddle because obviously having eight ten stones sitting on their back or more in my case then um it can make a difference to how the how the horse actually moves and it's and how it sits and i do this a lot i'd like to be able to do it at a much higher level because it's really interesting to me um we also use shims because we find that we've i use them as a tool to find blockages so I will have a look at how the saddle is sitting and how the horse is moving. And I'll use small shims all over. You've seen me do it um, to see where we can get the horse to move more. And we find that there is minute areas underneath some particular some girth that by actually padding a tiny bit, we get a huge movement in the horse, a huge change in the horse's movement. And we find that by putting the rider in a slightly different position you can actually allow them to change their muscle memory and establish a new muscle memory and it can make them feel completely different um and i think i think you know it's really important for people to realize that shins can be used just as a, a bit of a short-term crutch and just bunged under by people but that's not how they should be used they use they should be used as a tool to help people sit in a good position the other thing I always say to people, as you all well know, is we never ride our horses standing still. As soon as the horse moves, the saddle, the back changes shape. So if you measured a horse when it's standing still, we've actually had um, research done on this, which has been proven and uh, published. Um, when you actually lunge a horse without a saddle on, then the horse is a different width than when you lunge it with its own saddle on. If you lunge a horse with a wider saddle on, the horse being an interpressure animal will go up into the saddle. So if you fit the saddle slightly wider, the horse will lift up into this and actually offer the back that you are out there looking for. They will actually invite up, back up, you know, invite the, that, the back up into the saddle. And obviously we've, we've both had a sort of, uh, an amount of ride with your mind training and that's really interesting again in that that is the way of using your body to help invite the, the horse up into the saddle just using your slight change in how your muscle tone works we have okay, so, muscles rather than relaxed muscles so just to go back to that bit so what we're saying is that the way that you use shimming and i know it is incredibly effective because i've had two or three different horses that I've had that you have made a massive difference to them, particularly my young yeah. one who, you know, was young and he didn't have the muscle and he's been able to develop it. He's hench now. Like he is. Yeah, he's, he's never had unit. a bad back. No, and he's never <laughs> had a bad back. Exactly. Um, exactly. Because we didn't fit a saddle. Now everyone thinks you fit a saddle to their back as it is. And then yeah. as their back changes, you change the saddle fit. But actually what yeah. the interesting thing that I've always found over the years is if you fit a, a saddle to how their back is, let's say an atrophied back where it yeah. hasn't got the muscle it can't it can't develop the muscle because you're always you're always yeah. putting the pressure on where it needs to develop that muscle aren't you so the idea yeah. of, of fitting slightly wider and popping what we call the shims which is basically padding in is yeah let, correct me here is that actually it allows the muscle to develop because it can squash the padding a little bit as it develops and then yeah. we start to take the padding out don't we yes it allows the horse to lift up into that saddle surface because it gives you and it makes the saddle just that little bit narrower and gives you that little bit of a solid a, um, a solid area to lift up into and it gives you actually it also gives you a flatter area because a lot of the saddles are actually very rounded the very nature of flock is that the flock goes into a rounded surface and um, people laugh at various instruments that I use when I'm flocking but I want to get the flattest surface possible I know that you laugh a lot sometimes but I want to get the flattest possible surface because our horses don't have rounded backs they have flat backs and so a shim will also spread the weight over a larger area 
in a flatter area and even out any curves that you don't necessarily want in the saddle and so you can do a huge amount with shims absolutely huge amount and it means that you don't necessarily need to change saddle as you know that's the thing i love about it is that we fit a saddle to kind of where we want his back to be we, we did yeah. didn't we? and then shim it up and see how it goes and we watch it's really interesting watch the progress of his back do, yeah. depending on what we've been doing and what i've been doing whether i've had my physio and things and we can really track it can't we and i yeah. know you say some people get a little bit obsessive about it so some people you weren't allowed to see the, the shakes but i'm okay <laughs> i'm all right i'm allowed to um but it's been really interesting because actually you know yes there does come a point where sometimes you need to change saddles and i have had to I've had him a couple of years now and he is now in a slightly yeah. different saddle um although i seem to have somehow four of them i have a working hunter for showing I have a jumping for jumping I have a dressage for dressage and I have a side saddle you know that's just because my body does not allow me to have a GP I'd love a GP that would be incredible <laughs> wouldn't it Julie to have one saddle how amazing would that yeah. be but that's yeah. the other thing we've had to look yeah. at isn't it you know like um we've changed you things have got <laughs> I have got a very long thigh bone haven't I which some Incredibly people are very jealous of bone. until you come to yeah. try and get a saddle that fits <laughs> yeah. Yeah. on a big it's shoulder exactly. torso yes much so, amusement with <laughs> yes it's been fun of, but he is one of the hardest people to actually fit in a saddle thanks thanks for that I so long. <laughs> thinks i'm being a diva having four saddles but actually i'm not i mean one's a side saddle so like obviously that's different but um, i genuinely saddle, yeah. i genuinely have different needs but enough about me but the point the point was that's great is if you've got a young horse or horse that's developing or when i bought my 14 year old horse as a school mistress um her back yeah. actually she she'd come out of work and, and I was bringing her back in and her back was atrophied and oh my god the difference that you made with that saddle in fact um do I still own that saddle I think that's still my working hunter saddle actually is the one we put that on is, her that, the first one was the work yeah was it's still your working hunter saddle now so yeah, yeah so that's been through two horses yeah and I mean it's that was luck different. not judgment wasn't it <laughs> that, was, that was actually amazing it just showed your old your old thoroughbred was a lot wider than you realized yeah she really was <laughs> so, um yeah. But yeah but the difference that made in her back was incredible so you know we yeah. can really help the horse to recover because I know you used to I, I think you still do a lot of it but you still do a lot of rehab saddling and, and, and things like that didn't you yeah that's that's my favorite thing I like rehabbing saddles put doing rehab horses and I love rehabbing riders and working with riders to get riders actually straight um and I also I mean that that's that's probably the thing I like doing most is being able to work with a physio in very close contact. There's um, various people that I work with. Um, Chrissy Dodd is probably the one that I work with most who does, who is a Boeing person who's absolutely, you know, fantastic at doing these. Um, there's other saddle fitters, you know, other, other saddle fitters that I help that and I, I give advice to, but, and there's other physios that I actually work with because I like a horse to see a physio two to three days before I saddle because I like to be able to saddle a fresh back so that the horse hasn't got the muscle memory of how the saddle did, used to feel and we can actually start with a freshly flop change saddle on a freshly on a comfortable back and see what we've got and see what we actually then need to do and also I like to have a physio's um, report to work from so I like to know what's going on with the horse and I can when a horse is going through a real rehabilitation I can take the pressure off various parts of the back I don't think people realize just how much we can actually do but I uh, this isn't a, a standard saddle fitter but I can certainly change the way that the horse moves by putting the weight of the rider an inch further forwards an inch further back allowing the shoulders to move using the shins to um allow one shoulder to redevelop um i've got um i've worked with some horses that you know have practically been written off and been written off by the royal veterinary college i can think of one um and certainly we've got him huge, huge improvement and the horse has now been started to go back jumping at a low level as well which we'd never have thought would have happened a year and a half ago but that took I do a rehabilitation program and I come and see your horse for a smaller amount, but I come and see it every four to six weeks as it's needed. And we change the saddle and change the balance and change the shims and we redo your horse every and four I, to six I went, weeks. I went through that with you because my mare, she had kissing spines. Yeah. Um, she had injections. Um, but, you know, I, I knew I had you on board on the team and, and you were straight yeah. on it. So as soon as she'd had the physio that she needed and things like that, and they said, right, let's get this, you know, you can you can start ridden work. And now, my God, that was the most important thing for me to make sure that that saddle was then supporting the redevelopment of her back. 
yes. rather than hindering yeah. it. And yeah. having you coming out, I think you came out to me every sort of four weeks or so. Do you know, by the end of, um, so it was the July that she had the um, injections. Yeah. In the September, we did our first BE80 and she was on better form than she's ever been, wasn't she? It was just yeah. incredible. Yes. It really was. It was. And we, you know, we wouldn't have been able to do that by doing saddle fitting once every six months. And people don't realise the importance of actually getting your saddle absolutely spot on. Um, and it, I find it difficult sometimes because the, it's quite often the rider that will actually say, oh, no, I can't do that. And the horse is going, yeah, yeah, this is great. And the rider's going, oh, no, it doesn't feel quite right. And sometimes they won't actually take your advice because to them it's different. And sometimes you to get your horse right, it has got to feel a little bit different for a couple of weeks and then we'll change it again. And all of a sudden it will all make sense and it will actually be correct. Oh, there was one sort of top rider who said, oh, no, I can't possibly ride like that because my thigh is like half an inch out of where it should be. And you're like, well, but your horse is moving beautifully. And I remember going to a demo um, a few years ago with um I was there with a the physio and um, everyone was looking at the saddles and trying on the different saddles. It was a saddle manufacturer's demo. And I put a saddle on that I I had made and half of the fitters and the physios there looked watching and said, oh my God, that horse is moving really well. The other half said, oh, the rider can't sit, that, sit, sit in that saddle. And you're like, well, which do you want? Do you want the rider? not being able to sit in it who could maybe learn to sit in it or do you want and or do you want the horse to move that beautifully and that loosely and a lot of them couldn't see that the horse was moving really loosely really beautifully and in a few weeks time would have actually gone back to the movement it was doing but uh, at a much higher level if the rider could actually sit on it and the other half were going well the riders the rider can't sit that horse because of the saddle and you're right, well, the rider couldn't sit the horse because the horse was had twice the movement it had before. And she was finding it really hard to do a rising trot to a much longer, much bigger, much more upright stride. And that really that really hit home to me that half of the people are looking at what the horse wants and half the people are looking at what the rider wants. And there was only two of us there together in a corner <laughs> going, well, that's what I want. <laughs> I want. I want both in, both on board and both improving. And that's when I really thought, actually, we really need to somehow change this and change things. And it's great that I've got good people that I work with now, but I wish that more people would go, actually, we need to have a good change. And I'm really pleased with some of my riders. I mean, I've had some people do really, really well. Um, I had, at one point last year, I think I had five out of the six top people in one of the in, in a bd class at elementary and i was like yes and i don't promote myself like other people because i don't really need to because people i like people to come to me but i do i do especially with the dressage riders i think they get quite shocked when i'm sort of standing there with like five foot four and round and i go yeah a little late behind don't you think when you're flying change they're like how do you know that i'm like well i spent two years looking watching people do it and I can see, I can teach, I can work at that level. I can work to actually get a little bit more movement here and a little bit better walk. Um, so it sounds to me, sorry, carry on. Sorry, carry on, you carry on. I was digressing. I, I know, I was just going to say, so it sounds to me like, um, obviously we want rider and horse happy. That's always the key, isn't it? But what you're saying, or and what you're saying, is that um, often when you adjust something, so the horse is then suddenly able to move and happier. And I have felt yes. this myself. Suddenly yes. my mare moved a shoulder and I was like, oh my God, I can't sit to this. And you were like, well, you're going to have to learn to. Um, it's that kind yeah. of open mindedness, isn't it? It's that kind of yeah. idea of, well, actually, like you want your horse to be at its best. You want your horse to feel its best. You care and love your horse. So let's get your horse happy. And do you know what? You're a human. So you are going to be able to adjust to this much easier. You're going to have to put the work in or change yes. your thinking, but you can adjust. Let's not get you yeah. feeling happy and your poor horse, who doesn't actually know any different, is just kind of managing with whatever it can do. And you might not be harming it particularly, but it's not yeah. as happy and able to move and be free and, and able to express itself. And we want expressive horses, like in a nice way, don't we? Especially in dressage, we, we love expression. So it sounds it's to me like just, it's not always just about dressage either. It can be a happy hacker that all of a sudden will leave the gate 
it will actually go up the road on its own. And a horse that's been really nappy was actually going, actually, I don't want you sitting on my back like that because I'm not comfortable. And all of a sudden it'll go up the roads and people have got all this panic and worry that, you know, there's something wrong with their horse. But actually their saddle won't let, won't let it go up the road and they just won't want to do it. So we have to remember that it's all it is all horses and I've got some fantastic happy hackers and I've just changed the saddle a little bit, got completely on board and the horses have all of a sudden, they've been like, I've just had tearful people on the phone going, oh my God, my horse isn't napping anymore. It's going up the road. So it's, it's all of them. But, you know, we do love our dressage horses though, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. And I I think the thing that's really fascinating as well is when you think about where we sit a saddle and, and where the points of the tree go, the bit that can easily dig in and where yeah. we tend to, you know, the old fashioned method was to flock or to pad to fit the shape that we've got. Whereas we're saying, no, you don't do that. You put something in and allows it. But that's actually a junction, isn't it, for loads of nerves and joining yes. of muscle and so many things. As soon as you start to impinge that even slightly, you are it's like wearing a belt that's too tight, isn't it? Yes, definitely. I mean, we, we call we call it the junction box, and the whole idea is that you actually free the junction box. And some horses need a much freer junction box than others. Um, when you look at a lot of horses, um, people say, "Oh, well, he's got high wither." Actually, they don't have a high wither. They've basically their junction box is actually missing. They've actually got a hole behind the shoulder blade. So if you can actually you know, if you've got a dent behind your shoulder blade, it's not because you've got a high wither, it's because you've got a low muscle and you need to get your muscle back working and you need to get some sometimes quite extreme saddle fitting to invite that muscle back up and allow that shoulder to start to travel backwards, which is when you need a physio involved and which is when you quite often will need, a, you know, a coach involved for the rider. But it can you can change it in literally weeks three three four weeks we've had a huge huge amounts of difference i just, do love just, your phrase because i i know after della's kiss and spine surgery you used that phrase you said right we're going to do some extreme saddle fitting and i was like oh this sounds fun <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah and i think it, it is i i mean i was i heard um when I mean, I've been told that, you know, it's an extreme saddle fitting. I think it used to be extreme saddle fitting. It's it's not so much anymore because people are realising just just how much what you can do with different materials. But, you know, people are like, well, you sh you shim everything. And I was like, you know, you you know, I don't shim everything because you I don't, you've got a shim on your horse at the moment. But you've got a horse who will round up and come straight up into his back. No problem into his saddle. No problem whatsoever. Only and because when he was young. Cool we got in there to make sure that he wasn't impinged so that he could do that that's why you know what's the great thing is that when you actually look at horses and some of the horses that I've done from the beginning who have never had a bad saddle and he's never really had a bad saddle on him and I know I've got another friend who's who I've saddled her horse since before he was back and he did his first canter yesterday and he's in the same saddle that he was started off in and you know it's your other horse's saddle and it fits beautifully and you know she's happy as larry because she's never had to change her saddle and we got it as bargain two years ago so <laughs> it's not about the money it's about the fit. i'd rather that you had a slightly cheaper saddle and paid for physios instructors and regular saddle fits that's that's the way that it should be you shouldn't be having to pay oh can we digress onto something can we go on to when you when you see all the all the things on British dressage, you know the ones I mean. When yes, you go, go for it. I've got a, one of these. What saddle should I have? I have been guilty of doing that one because I just I? needed a little bit to start off with. I was also talking to you, but yeah, go on. Yeah, no, I, and you you get people go. What saddle? What saddle is best for my horse? It's like you going okay, going into a clock shoe shop and going. Well, what saddle should I have? Oh, I have that in that size. Okay, I'll buy that one. Oh, it doesn't fit. Well, that's because you've got a different size horse. Everyone, every horse is a different shape. Every rider is a different shape. Um, we could go madly into pelvises, but I'll leave that to somebody else who I know you're going to be talking to. Um, but there is a huge amount of different size widths of pelvis. We've got um, photographs that actually show that people's pelvises are, can be really wide, really narrow. I've got a really narrow pelvis. Um, despite my size, mine's really narrow. And it means that because my pelvis is like that, I tend to fall off the sides. If you've got a pelvis that's more like this, you're going to be le less balanced front and backwards and you're more likely to get a mash front. So, and people, 
will will say on, on you know especially on British dress in the forums they say oh this is the one the right pelvis and it's like oh do you know that person has got exactly the same pelvis as you and you know most saddle fitters don't even know the amount of difference it makes you know to and what you should look for with the pelvis and it's it's quite quite horrific what can happen and another thing I'd also like to say that actually while we're touching on the front of mash mash bits mash bits are not acceptable they don't need to happen tell your saddle fitter that it's happening I did have a lady who had actually been bleeding for two years and her BHS instructor had told her that it was because she wasn't sitting in the right position and she cried when I put her in a different saddle and it didn't happen she said I felt worthless for two years because I'd not been able to tell them what I wanted, what I, they hadn't been able to, they just said it was me and I was doing it wrong. And she said, and I can't believe that after two years, you know, you've just, it, it was actually them. So if you've got mashed bits, you will know what I mean. Please tell your saddle fitter or ring me up and I'll tell you what to do. But don't be afraid of it because um, it happens to an awful lot of people and a lot of people will, spend a fortune on special pants special padding and it, it is because your saddle is wrong for your anatomy and that is that's the bottom line your saddle is not right so if you get on a horse and the saddle doesn't feel quite right and it's uncomfortable please don't buy it because it means that it's not working and don't listen to your saddle fit when they say you'll get used to it because most of the time you won't get used to it you are actually going to end up hurting so, so can I just sorry, ask you, obviously, none, bit, none of us want mashed bits. That sounds horrendous. I have to say, I can't even imagine the idea of mashed up bits, to be honest, male or female, whichever. But so that's interesting, though, because yeah. a minute ago we were saying that we need to get the saddle right for the horse. But then if the ride is not yeah. ideal, we need to adjust the ride. Yeah. And then you've just said, so I just want to clarify this because someone will ask it otherwise. Then you said, oh, well, if you get in the saddle and you're not comfortable in it, then, you know, you need to tell them. So how do we get this balance then, Julie, between like, you know, both being comfortable it it takes an it can take an awful lot of time it can take an awful lot of time what I like to do is I like to get people where possible sitting correctly and working with the horse correctly in their original saddle because it's only after working with a horse a rider closely for a short amount of time maybe a couple of saddle fits that you suddenly realize that as they become they manage to start moving in a different way and their horse moves in a different way that they actually need something completely different imagine someone that would had your length of leg that was riding really short because they've been holding themselves in place they might need something approaching a jump saddle to do dressage whereas if you actually rebalance the saddle and let them allow their legs to hang and their legs to work at a different angle, then they need a different saddle. And so what you wouldn't want to do is actually put them in the wrong saddle immediately. But people are way too quick to make a decision and they they need to start to actually sit back and think what they actually need. And actually, and quite often people go, oh, this is the best saddle I've ever sat in. And you're like, OK, but sit in this one as well. Oh, yeah, this is the best saddle I've actually sat in. Now, if you don't sit in quite a few of them, You've got nothing to compare with. And you often will hear people go, oh, this is the best saddle saddle ever. This is the best saddle fitter ever. And that was probably the only saddle that person has sat in, the only instructor they've ever had, the only saddle fitter they've ever had, the only farrier they've ever had. And yet they're actually out there advising people that this is the one to have, this is the person to have. When they've actually got no experience of more than one, I'd much rather that people actually listen to their physios I mean, a good thing to do is who does your physio use as an instructor? Who does your physio use as a saddle fitter? Who does your saddle fitter use as a physio? Find out what the professionals use and use those people. But, you know, you really need to not listen to people that maybe have only got experience of one particular thing and, you know, actually become a little bit more broad minded and actually research your subjects better. And, you know, it's, it's the same as people will come to you, won't they? And they'll go, oh, well, you know, this person's the best ever or, you know, you're the best person. And you don't want to be the best person they've ever met. Well, you, you are the best person they've ever met. But you, it's even better if you're the best per people of four they've ever met or 10 they've ever met. That's that's loads better. Loads and loads better, isn't it? Yeah. So and that's actually something that, that 
you know, I come across, no, no, it's perfect. It's, uh, you know, someone goes to me, well, I've tried NLP before. And, and my immediate thought is always, well, firstly, I don't just do NLP. Like that underpins everything. But secondly, yeah. like that's saying, well, I've learned maths from a maths teacher before. And it's like, well, they might just not have been the right maths teacher for you. It doesn't mean that maths exactly. is a load of pants, you know, and it's the oh, same exactly. with Saddle, isn't it? You know, and, and the reason that I loved it when I found you so many years ago is because I had just finished a six month course all about holistic horse management. So not yeah. the traditional BHS stuff. I've done that. Yeah. learning as well but the the stuff that's not covered in their things you know the alternative ways of looking things the learning about it now it doesn't mean I'm bitless shoeless bridleless clueless or anything like that it means that I've yeah. researched all of that and then yeah. started looking into saddles and and what needs to be different about them and learned about the junction box and the biomechanics and what might not be right and looked at my horse's back and went mm, I think what I might have been doing over the last god knows how many years might actually be wrong and that's really hard to admit yeah. actually it's really hard to admit that something that perhaps you've been doing and you've probably been telling others to do because you might be one of those people that's saying this is the way you do it. Or even you've been in the industry for donkey's years, you're a coach, you're a trainer, you're a yard manager, whatever it is. For you to actually look at something and not just dismiss it, not just go, oh, that's not the way we do it. But to look at something and go, well, that's different. Why on earth would you be doing that then? Especially if you're seeing results from yeah. someone or you're hearing good stuff and to think, well, why might that be different then, as opposed to just, no, it's not the way I do it, so therefore it's wrong, which is what we're trying to do with the idea of the way that you saddle fit, and you're a consultant yeah. in it, not a fitter, yeah. aren't you? You look at the whole thing, and I think it's really important for people yeah. to be open-minded about stuff, so go and learn some of it. Like, I am not, by any means, in any way, a saddle consultant, or in any way as knowledgeable as you, but I know enough to know when someone's saying something, I think, oh, in my, like, what I've learned, I'm not sure that quite fits. Yeah. Um, and then to question it. So, you know, what would you say about that? You know, because you are going against the norm of saddle fitting, you know, master saddlery, all that kind of stuff, aren't you? You're going against what has been around for donkey's years. And I think, although I think that's coming around thing, now. The wonderful thing is that, that people are starting to, we're not actually not normal anymore people have actually started to look at what we're doing certainly um people um uh, like um russell guire has bought you know saddle fitting on in leaps and bounds his research has been brilliant um certainly the, the society master saddlers have bought this have come on board with this i mean um when i was trained the first thing we had to do was dissection so if you couldn't do dissection and you didn't know what was underneath the horse's skin, as far as Lavinia was concerned, then you, you know, you needed to know that before anything else. And, you know, so we start with, we started with dissection and what was underneath. We Luckily, we didn't dissect humans. I'm not sure if I could cope with that. But, you know, we, we all have a, a love of, a love of like dissection and feel and be able to feel what's actually going on. But the lovely thing is, is that, you know, over the years, things have changed. And people are starting to, the research is starting to happen. Um, Russell, as I've said, has been really good. Andy Thomas, who um, does neurokinetic therapy and is a, is a coach. He's been traveling around the country, been to all his courses. There's a lot of people say, oh, I do biomechanics, I've done this, that, and the other. And I think, you know, it's great that people, that saddle fitters and instructors are actually taking this on board and trying, starting to work with it. And they're starting to catch up. And I think, you know, people will argue, but I do think they are feeling doing a bit of catch up because, you know, the things that I'm researching at the moment and I'm working with people with at the moment, as far as I know, it's not being researched, it's not even being looked at. And, you know, that the latest things that I'm doing, which is, you know, um, various parts of pressure, um, you know, I just suddenly get a bee in my bonnet about something and off I go, as you know. But, you know, I've discovered that, you know, out of 35 horses, 32 of them, um, it made a difference. Of, so that doesn't seem to me, but, you know, trying to get that actually tested is nigh on impossible because people are always testing what's already been researched because they're backing up the research rather than I wish people would start to look at new things and actually research what could happen rather than actually prove, prove things. So people don't spend a lot of time proving things that we already know to say that it's right rather than researching things that I would like to have researched and I could because I look at a horse and I go okay why is that sweat patch there what's that doing what's that doing why is that friction there as you know and I'm like right how do we sort that how much difference does it make if we allow that horse to move through that muscle 
and you know the the, the latest things I've been doing that it's 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 I wish that everyone knew about it because you know the horses can really really start to move and you know every every person I see now I test this with the horses well, unfortunately we've had the lockdown so we've only been able to test it on my horse a lot thank you very much to the very nice lady who's riding my horse because she's suffered a lot <laughs> um, and you know I've tested I've tested an awful lot over the last over the last few weeks and it's it's interesting that you know you get these things and you get these things changing but you then can't get them tested until they've been used for three years because people are like oh yeah well it's tested it's already done so yeah that's a little bugger of mine we digressed again didn't I so but all the time I'm looking for balance what what is going to make the rider sit well what's going to make the horse sit well and one of the one of the worst things that happened to me but also the best is the fact that I've had goodness knows how many knee operations big time in the operations and this um led to me i spent a lot of time having to work out how to get my knees to work because they said i've got arthritis in this i've had a lot of horn operations on one i've now then fell off a year ago and i've had um i've torn ligaments in my legs and i've had to rehab it so i i was i was sort of thinking one day and I know I, I actually have Bliss come come running in and going, I'm oh, bored, what should we do? And I was going, right, I'm thinking about this. And Bliss is a BHS instructor. And then we suddenly, and she said, how about that stuff who used to teach me? And I was like, what stuff? And over the years, I've done a lot of two injuries. I've done a lot of Alexander therapy, a lot of Pilates instruction, a, a, a lot of Pilates learning. I've learned a lot of different things from a lot of different people. And I said, well, she said, those things you used to teach me, can we do something with them and I was like yeah okay so we invented this course um matrix riding off the horse because when our pet hates it's like why why do we try and sort our bodies out while we're sitting on a horse why why don't I, you know and why don't we actually sort our bodies out before we get on the horse why do we have to ride around with our legs in the air on the lunge to actually work out where our seat bones are when you can sit in a chair why do the horses have to put up with this? And, you know, and she was like, yeah. And she was very really enthusiastic. She was like, yes, let's do it, Julie. So Matrix Riding Off the Horse was born. Um, and we basically spent an awful lot of time running up and down the road outside my house. I'm not exaggerating here. Working out exactly how we could put this into practice, which led to the, the Matrix courses being being born which was basically a course you went to once a week in a in our local village hall and we taught people how to stand straight and this was an experiment to start off with um and people were like right okay let's let's try it and i'm really really grateful to the people that came along the first time because and so we we worked it all out but we see because because we've both been college lecturers we did it properly. We did lesson plans a lot. So we've got an entire lesson plan on how to do this. It's very structured. And we taught people how to how to stand straight and how to start to think about move straight, moving straight and how to check whether they were straight just by standing against a wall and doing one exercise. Um, that was pretty much what we did the first week. We talked about things. We tried it. We talked. We tried. We talked. We tried. We talked. We tried, and we did it by repetition. And we sent everyone away, away and said, "Right, do this for a week, while you make a cup of tea." And the next week, we just had the explosion of, "Oh my God!" It made so much difference. I could drive my car. My back didn't hurt. I could ride my horse. My horse is going forwards. And the best one was like, "I can turn right." That was that was really good. So. And we were like, whoa, this this has made a huge amount of difference. So we moved we gradually we got a set of we got, had a set of six lessons which taught you what it means when a rider, when an instructor says more leg. What does more leg mean? Who's ever been taught what more leg means? And I used to have, I thank you to the people that used to shout, more leg, Julie, more leg. And I was like, I can't move my legs. Imagine I had no legs. And, you know, so we actually taught people to be aware of how their different muscles worked in their legs and what more legs could mean and whether people had restrictions and what they could do about it. And we discovered that we could get people to sit straight on the horse without actually looking at them or the horse by just working out where their seat bones were. And it was it was a, it was a no brainer. 
it was absolutely a no-brainer. We could just get people to sit and walk and stand and, talk and do everything straight. And it was mind-blowing how they moved. And what really, really we were shocked about was the fact that these people all of a sudden could walk properly and were feeling much more comfortable in their day-to-day lives. Um, so the next course I put one of my friends came along and she had been on two walking sticks and I said come along and do the admin and she was like oh okay I'm gonna do the admin well that lasted 10 minutes and she she did the whole course she did the whole course twice and started riding again after nine years um and so that showed us that it was really really good and I've just literally the lockdown's been great for me because I've just met someone who's an occupational therapist who's taken this completely on board and once we're allowed to to work again properly then we're going to actually take it out and we're going to do it for people who are injured and actually take it into the community which is what I was hoping to do it's like you know older people and people who think oh I can't move I can't do can't do anything and they can't do Pilates and things but this will give them a way to to you know develop and how they move so I'm always thinking and always developing different ways and um, I've been watching uh, Body Reset on um, YouTube and doing crawling across the floor because if you're crawling on the floor you can't fall over which is always good for me then I had another 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 friend that actually started watching it and she's got hanging hanging loops hanging out of her stable now and she actually hangs every day to sort her shoulders out again from body reset. So um, we've it, it's been really really interesting how much how much more aware I am of how people move and I mean this is some thanks to Andy Thomas because um, obviously he was he was the ex British Olympic physio and you know he got me thinking he also meant that I've discovered a different type of physio so I've got a local physio I can refer people to who's also an Olympic physio and I didn't realize existed and the neurokinetic therapy has made massive difference to my injuries in my life and I'd highly recommend him he's now my favorite person in the whole world because he's enabled me to start to start moving again so you know all all of these things that you know you look at and all of these things affect your horse and how your horse moves so it's not all about the saddle and it's not all about the rider and it's not all about the horse it's all about everything with the jam in the sandwich and I do the jam in the sandwich and what's sitting on the top and the bottom so we've got to get the two bits of bread right and they're our responsibility aren't they so we've got to get the top bit of bread that's us we've got to get that right as much as possible and then you know we've got to make sure we're doing the same for our horses as well and that doesn't mean just riding it's all the stuff we're doing with them all the time even lead how we lead them in and out of the field makes a difference to, oh, they're constantly yes, being dragged nice. along on the forehand then they're going to move yeah. that way because it's that the, yeah. i think the key thing with this is it's the sum of the little things that makes a big difference and that's the same in mindset in bodies in rehab in anything isn't it it's not let's go for the big thing it's let's do lots of little tiny incremental bits that add up to the big thing so that then when we look back we go wow look at that change that's happened because we haven't noticed it changing because we've made tiny minute changes which brings me on to the matrix has now gone online hasn't it so the course is now on (laughs) horseycourses.com so tell us just a little bit about if i've never heard of this thing so now you've told us about matrix which is great i've never heard of this thing i'm thinking god this sounds fascinating i've got this thing i want to work on or look at or you know change how how on earth am i going to do it online how does that even work because what all you do is you go onto the matrix and i think there's i don't know how many videos there are because we we literally we did it in while well, we were in lockdown um so we had to put all the videos i think there's about 20 in total something like that there's a lot of them yeah you go and you start the first one and you do the first one and you it's about a two minute video it's a really small sh- snapshot and you do it and you do it every day and you do it every time you make a cup of tea you do it The second one, um, maybe you follow it, maybe every time you go to go up the stairs, you stop and you think about what you're doing and how you do it. So you carry on with each of them. And there are exercises in each of them, like um, the one with the the reins. If you can get someone to hold the other end of the reins and move their hands so you learn how to follow the reins, this makes a, a huge amount of difference. So many people lock their shoulders, learn not to lock your shoulders and drop your elbows. Um, how how you do your rising trot you know because when I did the rising trot with you and we were always taught this is like a small snippet of one of the one of the lessons we've always been taught up down so you do 
up and you land, yeah? So if you think about it, instead of doing up, down, start at the top, touch, up, touch, up, and you can touch up or you can touch, hold up. If you Do you know how many people I notice down, now that splat? It's like, it's my filter thing, because I'm so aware of splatting. Like, you think yeah. you're coming up and down, but actually, as you land, you just kind of splat a little bit. You, you squash a bit of jam yeah. out. There you go. You just kind of yeah. squash a bit of jam out, so their back kind of has to dip just a tiny bit to take that. Exactly. So the horse has to take that contact, whereas if you actually touch up, then you, you can actually control your landing. It actually develops your thigh muscles and, and your core muscles really, really nicely, and it's very hard to do. But how much di difference does that make to the way your horse is back and your engagement? It's and, massive, isn't it? And the because cool thing is it's it. literally just following one exercise that's a really simple, I think you call it windscreen wipers, don't you? And it's literally just, just doing that. Yeah. It's so, and this is, the, this is the thing I love about it, is that it's such a complex topic. And my God, you know, we could sit all day and talk about it. We'd yeah. sometimes um, we go for a coffee <laughs> and we have breakfast, lunch and dinner. But um, we, you know, it's such a complex topic. But like with anything, if you just break it down and make it really simple, which you guys have done incredibly well on The Matrix yeah. and, you know, all the other things that you do, it's broken down and you just, it's a little simple bit and a little simple bit, then that's how we learn. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would massively encourage anyone and, you know, to bring it back as well to where we started, which is how it helps your confidence is if you, if you are aware of your body and it changing and slipping and sliding and not being balanced and being thrown at and things like, and you can, you can firstly become aware of what it is that you want to change and then go and find what it is that you can do to change it. That's really simple. can be done off your horse. We haven't got to interfere with them. And you just keep yeah. doing those little tiny bits, then you're going to come back and you're going to reap the benefit massively, aren't you? And so is your horse because they haven't had to deal with you doing that thing and them having to adjust and become, you know, it, muscle atrophied or compensatory absolutely. or anything like that. It makes you feel a lot more confident when you're riding because you're a lot more solid, you're a lot more established, and you've got way more strength just through your core. But without doing Pilates, you're just using your body in the best way possible. And, you know, we're you know fliss and i were like right we've got to do this in an easy way and we were just like right okay do it like that 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 and, that and we just went out and we were like okay let's do the exercises because i'd i just taught i taught her a few years previously and i used to teach her bits and pieces and she was like we, we need all this because people need to understand it and she's been out teaching people she's an instructor she does it all the time i use it for saddle fitting a lot because i'm like i don't want to sit a saddle and then have a ride again I want the rider to be in control because then your horse can invite through and a horse got a sacral out problem. Can we invite it through? In which case, can we change the saddle? Therefore, I'll come back in a month and we'll have a better horse. That's the way I work, which is slightly different. But and I think as you know, as a saddle fitter, I want you to look at me as a physio, not as a physio, but you know, and have me out as often as you might have your physio about every three or four months is ideal. Or more often, if there's, you know, I only charge the same amount can i just say one other thing you can, the difference yes. is is that when i come out and do an appointment i want to see your physio i do you want to see a physio report i want to see you with your horse i want to see your horse move um i will take profiles but they're usually just as an ex as a reason you know we don't live what live with profiles because you know the whole horse changes not just the back um, and I will need to see you ride for about 45 minutes. Now, there's a lot of people that go out and actually do saddles, adjust saddles without seeing the person ride. You don't ride standing still. You don't ride without a girth. So if you haven't actually, if your horse has not been assessed for a good 40 minutes, you haven't had your saddle checked as far as I'm concerned. And I spend about two hours with people. I say, we're going to have a nice cup of tea and we're going to talk about whatever you need. And sometimes it just helps to sit back and listen and then you find out what you, what that horse actually needs. And it's about the saddle, but it's actually always about the relationship. And if I can make you stronger and more confident and your horse stronger and more confident, then I will. I love that. That's amazing. And I love the fact as well that you don't just pop a saddle on the back and go, yeah, that fits. You also look at everything, but you will also look, and I've been privy to this and tried. I love trying things. You, I'm, I love being your guinea pig for stuff. You're like, oh, I've got this thing. Do you want to try it? Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, we've looked at girths. We've looked at stirrups. We've even looked at stirrup yeah. leather types and things. We've looked at yeah. different types of saddle pad and cloth and shim and all that stuff, of course. Um, but we've even started looking at, you know, bridles and reins, um, that yeah. kind of thing, you know, and all, 
anything that will it's not quick fix by the latest bit of kit by any means because you know it's not it is about I test everything you know how obsessed I am I I test everything that comes on the market I I try and test and not just on one person quite often I will buy them I will have them on my van people will say oh what's in your van today I'll say well this might work for your horse um I've always got a few products that I quite like um I will own I never push things I will only sell things that I like and if it doesn't work for your horse you don't get it but it means that you've got the opportunity to try the latest products that are coming out and you know see where they actually make a difference but it's not about the money it's like wow is this going to help your horse and quite often the products i've got will help your horse so i do have a little van of many wonders <laughs> it's like the ice cream van coming i love it i'm like oh what have you got that might help with this this and this and sometimes you go no nothing jen you've just you go and have some lessons love <laughs> like go and go and do your biomechanics go and do your physio that you're meant to do because there's not a product for that one it's like, all right okay well you know we all love to fix things a bit quicker and if something helps great but actually ultimately yeah. at the end of the day it's about this continuous learning journey isn't it and it's about just yeah, always trying to do the best we can yeah Cool. So have you got any really, really quick, because we're, we're on the hour now, nugget that you want to share with anyone before we leave that, other than the fact never you're the jam in the sandwich. Never saddle pit by Facebook. Never saddle pit by Facebook. What, as in like, go out to the Facebook experts? No, I've never listened to the Facebook experts. Never <laughs> listened to them at all, because okay. you just like, I don't want to be mentioned on Facebook. I'm just oh like, no, no i'll stop tagging you now but that's because i know how amazing you are <laughs> no, no, you, you, can, you, you, you can tag me but you just like sometimes you just don't want to be put in the same box as people yeah, don't yeah, listen yeah. to the facebook experts and if you say if you haven't ridden in your saddle your saddle bitter for as long as you would have a lesson or you would have to for the start of a dress off test you have not had your saddle fixed cool thank you simple. amazing thank you so much julie for explaining the jam um there's an awful lot to the jam we love jam. We love jam. We like a bit of bread as well, to be honest. So. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so, so much. It's been absolutely fascinating, as I knew it would be. We've covered loads of different topics. And if anyone wants to get hold of you, what's the best way, Julie? Um, Montague Saddles, www.montaguesaddles.co.uk. Fill in the contact form and or ring me up even. Cool. Because and if doing a lot at the moment, no, we're not so actually, you can have a chat with we're people. We're not saddle fitting fully for another another few weeks. I'm doing emergencies at the moment, but yeah. we've got to get the insurance reinstated, and people aren't realising that you know we do have to get that looked at at the moment. Yeah, of course. Okay, no, that's cool. And so anyone listening on to the podcast, um, so the website, they can get hold of you. And then if they want to do the Matrix online course at the moment, because now is the perfect time to do it. You can do it all from home. You don't need any special kit oh, okay. equipment or anyone with you. Just horseycourses.com. Yeah, horseycourses.com. Make sure it's riding off the horse. And it's on a really special offer at the moment, which is £10. And it's going to be more than that, way more than that. I think it's probably going to be about 60 normally, isn't it? Yeah, so it's an absolute bargain right now. So, yeah, go grab that bargain. So thank you so, so much, Julie. It's been an absolute pleasure to catch up with you as well and geek out. Um, hopefully I'll get to virtually see you again soon. And uh, if anyone wants to get hold of you, I'm sure they'll be in touch. So thank you so much. See ya. Bye.